Good morning. It is a uh, pleasure to be here with you. And uh, this is, uh, for me, uh, exciting because we get to talk about uh, one of my uh, favorite subjects, which is uh, the doctrine of baptism. And what I'd like to do this morning is I would like to begin perhaps in a very uh, non-intuitive place, and that is with the story of uh, green eggs and ham. Uh, perhaps some or maybe most of us are familiar with that uh, children's story. Uh, I'm not, I can't remember, and maybe he's never named, but uh, you, know, you see the funny creature and he comes around and he says, would you like some green eggs and ham? And for the, the, the majority of the book, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the tall creature keeps on saying, no, I don't want the green eggs and ham. I don't like them. I don't want them. Go away. I will not eat them with a fox. I will not eat them in a box. I will not eat them on a plane. I will not eat them on a train. Uh, and so then, all of a sudden, before you know it, they're sailing down and uh, on the tracks down the mountain. And then all of a sudden, uh, the train goes off the tracks and it falls into the water. And the creature emerges from the water. And then all of a sudden, he's willing to try the green eggs and ham. And he says, say... I do like these green eggs and ham. I will eat them with a fox. I will eat them in a box. I will eat them on a train. I will eat them on a plane. The big question is, is why did he change his mind? Did he just change his mind because he was tired and worn out? Or did the water make him change his mind? That's the big question. And Dr. Seuss never answers the question. You're just left to wonder, was there power in the water that made the creature want to eat the green eggs and ham? Well, obviously that's a bit of a silly illustration, but it, I think, begins to get at uh, the big questions when we're talking about the doctrine of baptism. Chances are, if uh, you run into any particular town, you will find numerous churches scattered uh, throughout uh, the landscape whether it's Baptist churches, Presbyterian churches, churches that descend from the Dutch Reformed tradition, congregational churches, Methodist churches, Anglican churches, Roman Catholic churches, and they all practice baptism. Granted, some use more water than others. Uh, Some use less. Uh, Some baptize adults only, adult converts. Some baptize adults and infants. And of course, what each particular church means by uh, the rite or the uh, sacrament or the ordinance, depending upon who you're talking to, uh, of baptism is going to be uh, variously defined. Granted, everybody is doing almost the same thing, but they all can mean something uh, very different. Moreover, there's also questions as to how many times Uh, can or should baptism be performed in a person's life? Is it a one-time only thing? When I was in seminary, there was a young woman who had been baptized uh, as a child, uh, but then she went on a retreat uh, where it was uh, an evangelism retreat, and she she rededicated her life to Christ. She was baptized there on the beach. Uh, And then uh, she came home, and her seminary church found out about it, and said, well, let's just make sure and lock it up here, and we'll have you baptized here in, in front of the the church, and then she went back to her home church, and they said, well, let's just be extra sure, and and let's baptize you here too. So in the course of a month, she had been baptized some three times. You know, uh, how many times should it be administered? Um, Do you pour it? Do you sprinkle it? Uh, Do you dunk them, uh, so to speak, or immerse them? Um, These are just some of the questions that inevitably come up with the the subject or the doctrine uh, of baptism. Uh, And so what I want us to do is uh, I want us to take a step back and I want us to go and look at this subject from a very kind of different side, a different different dimension or aspect so that we can hopefully get the big picture. And then in getting the big picture, this will hopefully give us uh, a, a different vantage point from which we can begin to answer some of these particular questions. Because invariably, I think what happens is that when we go to study the doctrine of baptism, we will go to the New Testament, we will look at the baptism of Jesus, we'll look at the baptism that occurs, for example, in Acts, and maybe a couple of passages scattered throughout the New Testament, 
But for the most part, we don't look at what the whole Bible has to say on the subject. And it is so important that we look at what the entire Bible has to say on the subject, not just the New Testament. Okay, so uh, what I want us to do, and we're going to uh, you know, spread this out over the next, uh, this particular lecture as well as the, the other three that follow, is the first thing we want to do is we want to have a brief survey, a brief survey of the doctrine of baptism so that we can at least figure out uh, and identify who the major players are. Uh, what are the major positions? And so we'll look at that, the key players and the key ideas. In the second lecture, we want to look at an idea that we'll say is baptism as new creation. Baptism as new creation. This is an idea that I think is seldom connected with baptism, but I, it's present there so strongly uh, throughout the scriptures. Uh, so we want to look at that because I think that Fundamentally, when people look at the doctrine of baptism, they think of it, I think, chiefly in terms of cleansing from sin. And though those ideas are certainly present, and it's almost kind of a given in that you apply water to something when you want to clean it, uh, there are other biblical ideas that we find connected with baptism, and one of those is uh, new creation. Uh, a third, the third lecture, we want to look at the idea of baptism as covenant judgment. I think few of us will connect ideas of judgment with baptism, uh, ideas of curse with baptism, but those ideas are also present. If you think just very quickly, for example, to Romans chapter 6, where Paul says that we were buried with Christ in baptism. Well, the idea of death and burial are invariably associated with curse, with death, with punishment. Okay, so at least at a very, very you know, quick look there at Romans 6, we can see those connections, but seldom, I think, do we explore the connections between judgment and baptism. Why, for example, does Jesus in the 12th chapter of Luke say, I have a baptism with which I must uh, you know, engage, with which I must, uh, must endure? And he's talking and referring and using baptism to refer to the crucifixion. Well, I, obviously, we have ideas of uh, judgment and baptism uh, connected. So uh, baptism is new creation. Baptism is covenant ju judgment. And then fourth, uh, baptism as a, as a means of grace. In other words, what's the relationship between baptism uh, as we administer it in the church and how and by what way do we receive God's grace through baptism? There are different answers to that particular question, as you can well imagine. So we'll look at those. And then the last session will be uh, a brief uh, session of uh, question and answers, where I am sure I will not answer every one of your questions. I mean, I wish I could, and I wish I could clarify everything. But at least what I hope to do is to be able to give you the big building blocks by which uh, you can begin to approach this question, hopefully afresh, uh, from a uh, whole Bible uh, perspective. So with that being said and done, let's talk briefly for the rest of the time that we have here in this particular session about the history of baptism. One of the things that I was just talking with Pastor Stan about is uh, I said that you know, it's so important anytime you're considering any subject uh, to approach the subject by first exploring the history of the idea. Because so often I tell my students, you can approach an idea and you, if you don't know its history, you probably aren't going to be able to understand a whole lot of what's going on. Imagine if you will, if we were to have a conversation, if I were to stand up here and talk with you for eight hours straight, I promise I won't do that, uh, you, would, you would leave very quickly. And then somebody walked in and said, uh, what are you talking about? Oh man, are you kidding me? It's going to take us at least an hour to summarize what we've been talking about for the last eight. Well, in order for that person who just walks in on the conversation to know what's going on, you need to do a little bit of summary to bring them up to speed. Well, that's what I want us to do here in this first session, is to kind of bring us up to speed. Let's find out what people have been talking about. So we are going to summarize... 2,000 years of conversation, oh, say, in the next 40 minutes. That sounds pretty doable if you ask me. All right, the first view, the first view is we want to talk about this, is called the sacerdotal view. Sacerdotal, S-A-C-E-R. 
E R D O T A L S A C E R D O T A L sacerdotal. Uh, this view is associated with the Roman Catholic Church. It's called sacerdotal because uh, it comes from the, 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 the Latin word that refers to priests, or that which is sacred. And in particular, uh, it's the idea that uh, priests are the ones who exclusively administer baptism, and they exclusively minister the grace that comes through baptism. Now that kind of sounds somewhat generic, but let's see in particular how this works. If we go back to uh, the first millennia of the church, millennium of the church, um, and the, particularly the views of St. Augustine. Okay? St. Augustine is perhaps the greatest theologian of all time. Uh, you know, he's referenced so many times. He's referenced by both Protestant and Roman Catholic traditions. Uh, he was, he's head and shoulders above so many others. Doesn't mean we always agree with him. Uh, but nevertheless, Augustine believed that uh, original sin affected everyone. Sounds so good so far. Uh, but that original sin, the effects of the sin of our first parents, Adam and Eve, affected everybody, but not only everybody, even including infants. And that nobody escapes the effects of the fall. I think Augustine would uh, undoubtedly point to the fact that uh, infants, for example, are even subject to death, sadly. And the reason that they're subject to death is because they've been affected by uh, original sin. But Augustine also held a view as what is known as realism. And realism is the idea uh, that, uh, that sin... Okay, this is a very brief and uh, very kind of big overview of, of this uh, teaching... But realism is the idea that sin physically inheres in you. It's something that is uh, physically stuck to you. Not in your exterior, as if it's dirt, for example, that you can wash off from your hands, but rather it is something that physically inheres in your being, in who you are. Okay? And so if sin physically inheres in you, then that means that it requires a physical remedy. Well, naturally, it means that it requires water. Okay? And so when a person is baptized, whether they be an adult or an infant, the water, uh, by uh, the miracle of God, uh, physically conveys God's grace to the recipient so that that grace removes the inhering sin in you. Okay? There's a sense in which we can say that according to Augustine, the water physically uh, extinguishes the sin. Going back to our green eggs and ham, uh, the, 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 the funny looking little hairy creature goes down into the water and the water has a magical power upon him. And the water changes his mind so that when he comes up out of the water, he wants to eat nothing but green eggs and ham. But you didn't know that we were going to be talking so much about green eggs and ham. Myself, I prefer bacon. Lots, lots, lots of it. It's my favorite green vegetable. Um, okay, so now, this, as you can well imagine, Augustine's understanding of this, uh, has an effect upon uh, one's understanding of salvation. Uh, Augustine taught, for example, that uh, you have to be baptized in order to be saved. Because if you do not have that, uh, that, uh, that, that, that sin washed out of you, well, then you have no capacity or ability to render obedience to God. Uh, Augustine also taught that, for example, that unbaptized infants uh, would go to hell. Well, why? Well, because, again, they had that inhering physical sin. And so, if this is the type of understanding that you have, well, then naturally, you would teach that you have to go and have infants baptized as soon as possible, so that if for some reason they die, uh, they don't go to hell. And in particular, uh, there was even sometimes the practice of the idea that, uh, you know, midwives or those who might give, help give birth, uh, you know, as, as midwives to small children, that they would have to perform emergency baptisms 
Because if an infant was potentially going to die right there in the birth process, well, they'd want, they'd want to make sure and rescue that infant uh, from the fires of hell. So you can see how, you know, kind of these things uh, all connect together uh, if you have a certain understanding of things. Well, what you have in the Middle Ages, as we kind of jump a couple hundred years, we're going to be leapfrogging through history, um, is that in the Middle Ages you have uh, middle, uh, theologians picking up these ideas from Augustine. And in particular, they pick up a phrase about the doctrine of baptism, and they say that baptism is a visible sign of God's invisible grace. A visible sign of God's invisible grace. And that through baptism, and you see this, for example, if you were to read Thomas Aquinas' uh, Summa Theologia, his big, humongous, uh, systematic theology, if you will, uh, he talks about this, that in baptism, when the water is poured upon you, or in this case, and I'm going to start throwing little comments in here like this, is that they were, believe it or not, in favor of immersion as their, their, uh, as their favored mode of baptism, uh, even for infants. That may seem counterintuitive, but yes, you would plunge the infant you know, and immerse the infant beneath the water. Um, in fact, I remember reading of an account where Boris Yeltsin, uh, you know, president of Russia a, long, a number of years ago, uh, said that um, a drunken Eastern Orthodox priest nearly killed him as an infant uh, because he held him under the water too long. So they, they, you know, the church has practiced immersion even with infants, uh, for, for a number of years. Um, we'll talk about some other peculiar baptismal practices as, as this lecture goes on. Um, but uh, as you place the person in the water, um, the invisible grace of God is infused into you and it conveys to you what's called a habit. Not the nun's outfit, okay? not an outfit, but a habit is a disposition towards doing good. And this gets physically infused in you through baptism. In technical terms, uh, it is the created grace of God. Okay. These views get formalized at the official Roman Catholic response to the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century at what's, been called, or what's called the Council of Trent. And this becomes official Roman Catholic teaching. So notice we've hopscotched from Augustine in the 5th century to the Middle Ages, now to the 16th century. And we see that in many ways the Roman Catholic view is essentially the formalized view of St. Augustine back from uh, the 5th century AD. And they say that it is um, the merit of Christ is received in baptism, and, and, and baptism initially gives a person their initial status of justified. They're declared righteous in God's sight because they have the invisible grace of God poured into them, infused into them, physically changing who they are internally. Moreover, one of the things that the, the Council of Trent formalizes is that baptism works and I'll give you the English and then I'll give you the Latin because the Latin's fun too, uh, but I won't needlessly bludgeon you with Latin, I promise, uh, is that it, it's, it's by the work performed. Or what's in Latin, ex opere operato. In other words, when you baptize, when the priest baptizes somebody, it just, it automatically works. The person need not have faith in order for baptism to work. Because you've taken water that has been set apart, blessed by the priest, uh, and through the words of institution, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes, puts created grace into that water, so that that water automatically works. All you have to do is just put it on the person, and it's done. Now, as a Protestant myself and as a Presbyterian minister, I want to say, you know, um, I don't want to be just a neutral historical observer, although sometimes you have to be at certain points, but I want to say if that's how it works, then why not get a fire truck 
full of holy water and go down the street just hitting everybody you can. They might be angry and wet, but they would be, you know, free from original sin and they'd have a fighting chance, right? You know, you're in a debate with an atheist and I don't believe in Jesus. Hang on. (laughs) Do you have a different opinion now? Um, you know, now, in one sense, there's no Roman Catholic priest that would say, of course not, that's not how it works. But I want to say, well, isn't it, isn't it kind of, aren't we heading in that direction? Uh, so that's what's known as uh, the, uh, the sacerdotal view. And in fact, uh, this is where we get, when it comes to the, the Roman Catholic understanding of the sacraments in general, baptism and the Lord's Supper more specifically, uh, Rome has seven, uh, but of the seven, this, the baptism and the Lord's Supper, you, you get this, what I, all I can say is describe it as kind of the magical view of the sacrament, and that you perhaps, all of us, or most of us, have heard the words hocus pocus. Hocus pocus comes from the Lord's Supper in the Roman Catholic Church. Because the Roman Catholic priest would stand up there and say, hoc est corpus meum. This is my body. And the people in the pews knew that something magical was going on. The priest says, hoc es corpus meum, and the people in the pews just see, hear hocus pocus. But it's to make this broad observation that in the sacerdotal view, it's largely, it's the water that changes you and does all the work. Now the Roman Catholics would undoubtedly say, no, it's God working with water. But I want to say, well, if it's just the application of the water that makes the transformation of the person, as much as we want to attach the work of the Spirit of God to the water, it seems like it's more of the water doing the work than the Spirit of God. But, anyway. So that's what we would call the, the, the sacerdotal view. Um, now, when we talk or when we talk about uh, the next view, we want to identify this one as the memorial view. Okay, so we have the sacerdotal view, we have the memorial view. And that during the uh, 16th century Protestant Reformation, you had a number of theologians who began to question a number of teachings of the church at this point. Remember, at this point, there is only one church. There's a sense in which it's not even technically the Roman Catholic Church yet. It becomes the Roman Catholic Church at the Council of Trent, where many of its teachings are formalized. But in particular, you had uh, one uh, Swiss theologian by the name of Ulrich Zwingli. Perhaps you've heard of him. Uh, Zwingli and a number of other Protestant uh, reformers, if, if you have the Roman Catholic view over here, that the water changes you and the water is absolutely necessary uh, to convey the infused grace of God, then they kind of swing the pendulum all the way to the other side, and they say, no, the water does absolutely nothing. It does absolutely nothing. And Zwingli comes to these conclusions for a number of reasons, but chief among them, chief among them, is the idea as to how do you define the term sacrament? How does that term define Uh, maybe you've heard me say that. Maybe when some of you have heard me say the term sacrament, it kind of doesn't sit well with you. You think, that sounds kind of Roman Catholic if you ask me. Um, And in fact, I can remember sitting in 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 a systematic theology class, and I wasn't going to, it wasn't a Roman Catholic institution by any stretch of the imagination, but it was a, it was a Baptist institution. And, um, one of my friends had the misfortune of using the word sacrament in this one-page paper that he had to write. And the professor asked him to read it. And, you know, that word went floating out across the classroom. And he says, what did you say? (laughs) He says, so sacrament. Because you have to write a paper, a one-page paper, on why it's not a sacrament. And your paper is the only paper that is going to be the grade for the whole class on that assignment. So you had better do a good job. Of course, my friend was just sweating it that night because he didn't want to catch, catch it in the neck in the hallway. He was like, what, you got me a bad grade. I can't believe you did that. 
But there's some people that just have this natural uh, knee-jerk reaction against that term. Well, if you study the history of the definition of that term, it takes on a number of different meanings, and it all depends on who's using it. In the case of uh, Augustine and these Roman Catholic theologians, a sacrament is a sign, a visible sign of God's invisible grace. Whereas for Zwingli, Zwingli says, no, no, no. This term, sacrament, comes from the Latin term, sacramentum. A lot of Latin words, you just add a couple of letters on the end and it becomes Latin. And, um, and he says, in the ancient Roman context, a sacrament was an oath. It was a pledge that a soldier took in honor of and in service to his commanding general. You know, just the other day I was channel surfing. I don't have cable at home. And so, you know, the lovely place that I'm staying has cables. Like, oh, I feel like a kid in a candy store. Like, let me start surfing and just clicking, you know, the channels uh, as quickly as I can. Um, and I, you know, ran across uh, the, Gla the Gladiator movie. Right? Well, that takes place in a context there where you have a general and you have his soldiers. And the soldiers would swear their oath, their pledge of loyalty, their sacrament to their commanding officer. And so you have Zwingli saying, that is how you define the term sacrament. Therefore, baptism and the Lord's Supper has nothing associated with it in terms of conveying grace to a person, but rather it is their pledge of loyalty, it is their pledge of loyalty to the Lord. This is my oath, this is my pledge to you, O Lord. This is how much I want to serve you. Okay. And so that's how he defines a sacrament. Now, um, Zwingli still maintained the necessity and the importance of infant baptism. because He approached it in terms of uh, the covenantal bi bi uh, binding that, uh, that families have in terms of their relationship to Christ talk about that you know, briefly here in the next couple of minutes after we finish talking about the memorial view. But there were other colleagues of Zwingli's who thought, no, all right, you haven't gone far enough. Um, we want to reject the idea of infant baptism. That's something left over from the papacy, from the Roman Catholic Church. You haven't gone far enough. We want to reject that because if you are consistent and a sacrament is truly a pledge, a pledge of loyalty, then an infant cannot offer his pledge or her pledge of loyalty. So therefore, we're going to exclude uh, infants from the reception of baptism. Okay. Uh, and then you even had them, what, ha what happens is that uh, they would, at first they started off by baptizing, they, they, they had a, a bunch of people come to the town square, they picked up a milking bucket, went to the fountain, and they started baptizing uh, adults. And they were called Anabaptists because the prefix Anna means again. Or Catabaptists, because again, the, the Greek prefix kata means again. So technically they were kind of called uh, rebaptizers because they were rejecting the Roman Catholic baptisms and they were being baptized again. Now the Anabaptists would say, no, our first baptism wasn't a legitimate one to begin with. This is our first true legitimate baptism. Now in one sense, I want to say that the Anabaptists were reacting to, I think, uh, some uh, legitimate problems in the church at this particular point in history. There was a lot of rampant corruption. And for example, they saw that these people would be baptized as infants and then would hardly show any kind of signs, interests, or care for the things of Christ later on. And they said, no, we want the church not to be something that you're simply born into, but rather it's a voluntary association. And not only is it a voluntary association, but you have to be willing to subject yourself to the ban. What's the ban? Well, the ban is the willingness to be subject to church discipline, to excommunication, so that if you act 
in a, in, a, in a disobedient, a sinful way, so much so that it is scandalous behavior, then you are voluntarily up front recognizing that you can and will be excommunicated and that we will hold you accountable. Something often that you did not see happening in the church in the 16th century at that point. So they were reacting to a lot of the abuses uh, that, you, that you find. So they said, no, baptism is the believer's pledge of faithfulness. Uh, this is, a, you know, the, and we are going to reject the idea of infant baptism. You're subjecting yourself to the ban. This is a completely voluntary association, not just something that you can be born into. Now, one of the important things to note about uh, this particular movement in the 16th century is that you can say that, yes, um, contemporary Baptist views find their origins, I think, in the Anabaptist movement, but they're similar, but I think that there are some differences. But I nevertheless just want to draw our attention to the fact that this is where these views originate. Okay? So that we have the sacerdotal view, we have the memorial view, and within the memorial view that would, at that particular point, embrace infant baptism, there's another variation on the memorial view that is the Anabaptist view that says, no, uh, we do not include infant baptism. One important point to note before we move on to um, the, uh, the, uh, the next view is that uh, when you read Anabaptist confessions, uh, Anabaptist documents, Anabaptist treatments of the doctrine of baptism, there is virtually no reference whatsoever to the Old Testament. There's just absolutely no reference to the Old Testament. It is virtually almost exclusively lion's share. Like I remember reading a couple of documents and you'd find a total of 20 to 30 references to the New Testament and maybe one to the Old Testament. And so you want to ask the question, uh, when we're constructing doctrine, do we just cut off half of the Bible and ignore it and say that it's irrelevant? Or do we look at the entirety of the scriptures to, to construct our doctrines? And obviously, we want to camp out here on the, on the latter position. That is, is, we want to look at the whole of the scriptures. So the uh, sacerdotal view, the memorial view, and then thirdly and lastly, uh, we have the, uh, what we call the covenantal view. Okay? Now, these categories are admittedly at, at points a little blurry because I think Zwingli would have considered himself covenantal. Okay, so there are some overlap, but we're looking at large, you know, big, big ideas here, the big labels here, and that with Zwingli, it's memorial is the chief focus, whereas in what we call the reform view or the covenantal view, the doctrine of the covenant is what features most prominently in this particular understanding of baptism. With the sacerdotal view, it's the idea that God is conveying his invisible grace uh, through the water, with the memorial view, it's the individual is making his or her pledge of loyalty to God. Whereas with the covenantal view, it's saying that God is conveying his grace, not in a magical way, but it's not just simply the individual who is doing something there. Or to put it in more, uh, you know, in these terms, Zwingli, you would know, what are you saying in baptism? But what the covenantal view would ask is, what is God saying in baptism? And that's an important question. What does God intend to convey through baptism? Um, and you find this, for example, um, at least, uh, as well as we would say that in the covenantal view, not only do we find that you can say that, sure, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's the believer's pledge of loyalty to a certain extent, but it, they also include the baptism of infants, but not in the same sense and for the same reasons as the Roman Catholic would baptize infants. Okay. Um, so what particularly does the uh, covenantal view uh, desire to convey uh, through its understanding of baptism? I think the clearest place we can go, for example, would be the uh, Westminster Confession of Faith. And I'm going to read a few selections here from the Westminster Confession of Faith, uh, 
uh, particularly chapter 28, chapter 28 of the Westminster Confession of Faith. If you don't have a copy of that, you can find uh, numerous websites online where you can uh, find this document and read it for yourselves. Uh, but Westminster Confession of Faith says this, Baptism is a sacrament of the New Testament ordained by Christ, not only for the solemn admission of the person baptized into the visible church, but also to be unto him a sign and seal of the covenant of grace. So, for example, the question would be, is what is God saying in this? Well, this is God's seal of his covenant promise. Okay. Um, it's to be unto him a sign and seal of the covenant of grace, his engrafting into Christ, so not just simply a pledge of loyalty, but rather this is, this is a visual way of God saying that a person is joined to Christ, of regeneration, of remission of sins, and of his giving up unto God through Jesus Christ to walk in the newness of life. So notice here that they include the idea of this is the believer's pledge. They don't exclude it. But it's a question of, is what is the believer saying? What is God saying, first and foremost? Because the believer didn't come up to heaven's door and say, Lord, I've got an idea. I'd like to create this symbol of my loyalty to you. What do you think? You, got, you, you like that? No. It was God who instituted these things. God instituted this through Christ. He's the one who instituted baptism. So what is he saying, first and foremost? And then secondly, okay then, yes, what are you saying? What is the believer saying in, in baptism? So uh, I think counterintuitively somebody would say, well, if, if you're a church that baptizes infants, then you must automatically therefore exclude the baptism of adults. No, not at all. Uh, Reformed congregations or covenantal uh, people committed to the covenantal view of baptism, they baptize adult converts. But yes, they also baptize uh, infants. Um, and we'll see that uh, when we look at some other things later on today. Uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith says, dipping of the person, this is paragraph three, into the water is not necessary. So they're not ruling it out. They're, saying, they're not saying that it invalidates baptism. But baptism is rightly administered by pouring or sprinkling water upon the person. Now hopefully we're going to see this exegetically or in other words, drawing it from the scriptures later on today in the next two lecture periods. But it's the idea that uh, there's not just one mode of baptism. That we find a number of different modes of baptism appearing in the scriptures. Whether pouring, whether being immersed, or even sprinkling. And that it appears in various parts of the Bible. So I think the Westminster Confession of Faith is correct here to say that there are a number of different modes. They show a preference for sprinkling, and that's fine. Uh, I think we can have our preferences, but we shouldn't automatically exclude a particular mode of baptism. Um, you know, uh, a lot of people don't realize it, as I said, that immersion was one of the more dominant modes of baptism, but the question is, is well, when did that change? And you re look into the history, and there's some weird stuff that goes on there. Um, you know, Often people say, well, I want to be baptized like Jesus. Jesus was immersed, therefore I want to be immersed. Um, but they don't realize that the early church baptized you. And yes, they would baptize you, and many times by immersion, but they baptized you just like Jesus. Buff. <laughs> so, <laughs> all of a sudden, that, yeah. and yeah, they would separate the church. <laughs> Say, this is a lady's only baptism, this is a guy's only baptism. You guys go down that end of the, of the lake or the pool or whatever, we'll go up here. Uh, and uh, this whole idea of being baptized in a robe, that's a relatively new invention in the church. You know, so it's like, if you really want to be baptized by Jesus, well, you know, <laughs> that, that takes on some other interesting uh, ideas. Um, and in fact, there's some peculiar comments in a few theological works that, yeah, well, for the sake of modesty, <laughs> oh, we have, you know, you, you know, we employ robes and what have you. So it's like, okay, praise the Lord for that. Uh, yeah, there's just sometimes it's like, you know, no, I, I, yeah, let's just, you know, let's not go there. Um, with infants, they said that uh, 
My preferred mode for the baptism of an infant is immersion, but because it is so cold in the winter, it can be dangerous, even life-threatening, to immerse an infant in water. You think, well, what are they talking about? Well, you remember, heat, central air, <laughs> HVAC systems, those are pretty new inventions. You go into some one of these uh, cathedrals in the 15th or the 16th century in the dead of winter in Europe, where the water is not warmed, it's put into a stone font, it's snowing outside, and then you go and, you know, I mean, that's ice chilling. And what happened on a number of occasions is that they would baptize the infant, the infant would contract pneumonia and die. So they said, why don't we just do a little bit less water? That's safer. You know, so there's all kinds of interesting facts that you run into when you're looking at these things. Right? So, uh, but I, I, hopefully we'll see in a little while that, uh, that, that a number, that the different modes are all acceptable. Uh, and in particular, we would uh, connect this with the very work of Christ himself in his own outpouring of the Spirit. But I don't want to get ahead of myself. Um, the Westminster Confession of Faith says, and this is a really important one to get, and we'll get to this when we get into the fourth lecture period, but it's the idea, they say, that... Uh, Although it is a great sin to contemn or neglect this ordinance. Notice that they call baptism both a sacrament and an ordinance. They're not so concerned with the, the connection of sacrament and the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, to quote Carl Truman, who comes out here somewhat regularly, um, he, he, he takes the NRA statement and he adjusts it a little bit. He says, doctrines don't kill people. People kill people, right? Just because uh, the Roman Catholics use a particular word doesn't mean, oh, we shouldn't use that word. Okay? Um, and so they call it a sacrament because baptism is sacred. It's set apart. But they also call it an ordinance because Christ has ordained it. He has established it. And it's a sin to contemn it. In other words, it's one thing to say, no, I don't want to be baptized. In other words... You're being disobedient to Christ. But it's entirely another thing to say that you couldn't make yourself available to baptism. You were ill, for example. Or, and this is one of the most appealed to uh, examples in the New Testament uh, among the theological literature that you find, the thief on the cross. He obviously was a bit busy. He couldn't get to baptism. So it says, yet grace and salvation are not so inseparably annexed unto it as that no person can be regenerated or saved without it, or that all the baptized are undoubtedly regenerated. Important qualifications here. This is, you know, the, the, the Westminster Assembly, they were a bunch of English gentlemen and a few Scots. And I think that they were very polite. <laughs> they didn't want to name names. And sometimes it bugs me and I wish they did. But what they're saying there is that they've got a nice little statement that rejects the Roman Catholic understanding of baptism. Because the Roman Catholics would say, no, salvation and the grace of salvation are intertwined with the water. You can't separate them whatsoever. And the Westminster divines are saying, and divine is just a 17th century word for theologian, the theologians that wrote the Westminster Confession of Faith are simply saying, no, salvation and the water are not so inter, uh, inter, intertwined that they can't be separated. And that a person can be regenerated and saved apart from baptism. Conversely, they say, just because you've been baptized does not automatically mean that you've been saved. Another important qualification. Uh, I remember my wife uh, had a co-worker, and this co-worker rarely, if ever, um, you know, darkened the doors of the church. And she had uh, a baby. Oh, great, joyous occasion, whatever. And so they were talking and stuff and said, oh yeah, you know, this is great, I'm looking forward, we're going to going to have my, my baby baptized. And my wife kind of, you know, scrunched her nose, scratched her head, and was like, well, I, I didn't know that you go to church. Oh, I don't, but, you know, we're just covering our bases. You're like, uh, this isn't a fire insurance policy uh, sold by State Farm. Uh, you know, in other words, there are a lot of people out there that think that, well, so long as I get wet, I'm covered and I've got my bases covered. Well, the Westminster divines are saying, no, 
And this picks up on an important element of baptism that we're going to get in the third lecture, which is baptism as covenant judgment. The waters of baptism can either be the waters of blessing or the waters of curse. Okay? And so it's an important distinction that they pick up there. Um, they talk about it as a means of grace. And we'll get into this in the fourth lecture. But the efficacy of baptism is not tied to that moment of time wherein it is administered. Again, they're being polite English gentlemen. They're rejecting the Roman Catholic view of by the work performed, ex opere operato. They're saying, no, just because it's administered doesn't automatically mean that you receive the grace. Yet notwithstanding, by the right use of this ordinance, the grace promised is not only offered, but really exhibited and conferred by the Holy Ghost to such, whether of age or infants, as the grace belongeth unto, according to the counsel of God's own will in his appointed time. In other words, they say, yes, it is a means of grace. And we'll get into the, the, the specific ideas as to how it is a means of grace. But it's not a means of grace simply by dumping the water on there, on the person. But rather, as we'll see, and I'm letting a little bit out early, but uh, it's okay. Hopefully this will be helpful, is that the sacraments are to the eyes and to the other senses, taste, touch, feel, what the Word of God is to the ears. What the Word of God is to the ears, the sacraments are to the rest of the senses. So that it's what we call the double preaching of the Word. God preaches to your ears, and he preaches to your eyes. He preaches to your hands. He preaches to your taste, because you taste the bread. You drink the wine. You smell it. And in this way, there's, there's a sense in which we can say that the gospel is preached to us as whole creatures. Not just our souls, so to speak, but as body and soul. And what's necessary here is the primacy of the word. Apart from the word, you just have bread and wine. Apart from the word, you just have water. The, the sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper, are dependent uh, upon the preaching of the word. You have no sacrament, no blessing, apart from that preached word. Okay, so that's an important thing to recognize, and that's what they're picking up on. Just as the word preached is a means by which God gives you his grace, not infused in you, he conveys the saving power of the Holy Spirit, so too the sacraments with the word preached convey grace. So it's not the memorial view that completely disconnects the grace of God in the sacrament, but on the other hand, it's not the Roman Catholic view that completely confuses the two and makes them inseparable. And then last but not least, uh, they say in paragraph 7, the sacrament of baptism is but once to be administered unto any person. And this, I think, is an important practical observation. It's an important practical observation that I convey very simply like this. When God speaks, he does not stutter. And when he says, this is my promise, he doesn't have to say it again. To pick up on that earlier analogy or that earlier illustration that I drew your attention to of this classmate of mine, who had been baptized a total of four times. Do you see the cycle in there as to how she was worried and the people around her were worried that her pledge was insufficient? It's kind of like when you, know, you, uh, you make an amazing promise to somebody. I am going to give you, and let's make this a realistic promise, I'm going to give you 10 pounds of bacon. The other day I was shopping, doing the shopping for my wife at the Costco and I went and got the bacon crumbles, uh, then I got the bacon and I realized, holy cow, that's $23 worth of bacon. When did this stuff get so expensive? And I thought, it's worth it. It's for the team. <laughs> so you're, I'm going to give you 10 pounds of bacon. And you say, really? Honestly? 
There's nothing else that I have to do to receive. I promise. Are you sure? No, really, I promise. I'm going to give you this, this, this gift. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. Stop asking me, otherwise you're going to get me upset. That, I think, is the nature of it, is that how many times do I have to pledge my loyalty to Christ? Well, if you happen to struggle with uh, the assurance of your salvation, you would probably need to be baptized every day. Lord, I'm not sure today. There have been many points in, in my life. It's like I, I, I'm very envious of my wife. My wife does not struggle with the assurance of her salvation. It's just something where she says, I don't know why, I've just never struggled with it. I know it's a blessing, it's a gift, I cannot take credit for it. But she says, I've just always been assured of God's love. I'm not that way. <laughs> uh, there have been times where I think, how could I say that? How could I do that? Lord, am I saved? And I can remember very distinctly driving one day on 285, which is the big freeway around at the Atlanta, the city of Atlanta, and I was moving right onto the interchange from 285 to go 75 north, and I remember thinking, Lord, I just don't know today. But then I was able to gain assurance by reflecting upon the fact that, Lord, my emotions may shift from moment to moment, but I know your promises don't. I know that you have promised these things. And it, that I may fail multiple times, but you don't. And I rested on his promises. And that's a sense, and that's the idea that rests behind the covenantal view, is that no, baptism is once, one time administered. Because in a sense, God doesn't stutter. This is my promise. Here it is. And so um, there are other dimensions to that and other aspects to that. Uh, but, you know, and I've spent a little bit more time on this view, but hopefully now you can see the three major views, the sacerdotal view, the memorial view, and the covenantal view, and you can recognize that uh, there are some significant differences. They're all using water. They're all saying, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, but they all mean some different things. They all mean some different things. Um, and it generates questions such as, what does baptism mean? Uh, to whom should it be administered? Is it a bare memorial? Uh, is it the outpouring of grace? Or is it a means of grace dependent upon the work of the Spirit by creating faith in the heart of the recipient? Um, well, what I want us to do in the next lecture period is I want us to look, to begin to answer some of these questions, not by looking at these particular questions first, but rather by taking several large steps back. And we want to look at the entirety of the whole Bible, not just the New Testament, but the Old Testament. Because I want to make the case that baptism doesn't just pop out of the, 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 the sand of, uh, of the Middle East there, uh, of, of the land of Israel, in the New Testament period with Christ's ministry or with the ministry of John the Baptist, but it begins in the Old Testament, particularly in the opening verses of the Bible in Genesis 1.1. That is the first place where we find baptism. So what does the, the Bible have to say about this? Uh, and in particular, I want us to ask these questions as to what are the connections between baptism and the ideas of new creation? What is the connection between baptism and covenant judgment? Why does Jesus call his crucifixion of baptism? Why does John the Baptist say that Jesus will not baptize with water, but that he will baptize with the Spirit? Uh, and how? How is baptism a means of grace? Uh, we wanna, I want to hopefully give you more and more information so that we'll, we'll see why we want to reject the sacerdotal view. Baptism is not a magical rite. But we also want to uh, differ from the memorial view. Yes, the believer is saying something through baptism, but most importantly, what is God saying? Uh, and this highlights the necessity and the importance of faith. And so uh, the next lecture period, we'll look at baptism as new creation. <laughs>